Hi everyone and welcome to Rave Today. So this event is part of the inaugural Sussex Festival of Ideas, an engaging and dynamic programme of talks, events and activities. So this festival is being produced by the newly formed School of Media, Arts and Humanities at Sussex University. This event is being recorded and will be posted to the Sussex Festival of Ideas website after the festival. Live captioning is available and can be activated by pressing the live transcript button on the bottom right hand corner of your screen. A member of the festival's team may contact attendees for feedback afterwards. If you do not wish to be contacted, please email the festival team to opt out. You can find the details on the festival's website. We welcome your questions via the Q&A panel, which you can also find on the bottom right hand corner of your screen, and we will respond to these later if time permits. And now I'll hand over to Dr Ben Burbridge. Thanks, Emma. Um, this is an exciting one. So I would just say very few words and then I will hand over to uh, Chris Warren. So this for me um, is, is a manifestation of, of some of the glorious things that the School of Media Arts and Humanities can be insofar as it, it grew out of people showing an interest in one another's work um, uh, and a kind of emerging sense that we shared some interests um, and something um, with huge potential could grow out of those interests um, and that we knew other people who shared those interests and maybe they could be part of the conversation as well. Um, and, and so those interests in this instance are kind of UK rave culture, but very broadly defined. Um, and I'm not going to say anything more about how we define it, because I think maybe questions of definition will, will play out through some of the presentations. Um, so in terms of the format, um, it's going to be about an hour of, of loads and loads of stuff with lots of people talking. And then um, my colleague uh, Lucy Robinson will, will come at the end um, and we'll see how much time we've got left for, for discussion and Q&A in the last 15 minutes. So, um, yeah, I'll pass over to Chris. Thanks, Ben. Uh, hello, everyone. So just very quickly to introduce myself, I'm Chris Warren. I'm a, um, a lecturer in the history department at the University of Sussex um, with a, an interest in uh, European history, but specifically popular culture, youth culture, subcultures and so on. Um, our segment uh, uh, today, and I'm, there's a, a five of us all together going to share a particular approach and experience of um, rave history. So our panel is called Why We Do Rave History. And it's part of a wider approach to uh, history that looks at popular culture, subcultures and youth cultures as uh, specific sites of historical change. So I'm going to very quickly present uh, a rationale for this approach to the past. It's obviously bringing two things together. So rave, post-rave on the one hand and a history on the other. But the main part of our panel uh, presentation will focus on an illustration of what that might mean in practice. So I'm going to introduce our panel now. So um, first of all, uh, Alyssa, Alyssa Stoddart, who's um, uh, an undergraduate student, just finished her history studies uh, at Sussex. We're also going to be joined by Daniel Whitaker Wallace, who's in uh, doing a, uh, the MA in contemporary history at Sussex and did a uh, history degree with us uh, uh, finished last year. Uh, Jack O'Connor, who's a PhD student um, uh, in history. And then uh, John Mason, who was a, a former Sussex student, but also goes under the name of John the Storyteller. And I'll explain what that might mean uh, in a bit. So first of all, what's the rationale for uh, why we do rave history? Um, I think our focus on rave and post-rave is by definition multifaceted and what we're interested in is uh, rave history as both content and method. So we're interested in, in this period of time for its content, it's a specific moment, an important moment of continuity and change, uh, not just in the UK but more widely. We like it because rave brings together the individual experience with the collective experience and it's a way of articulating those two in, in very uh, elaborate ways. Rave culture brings together a range of DIY, do-it-yourself, um, uh, improvised cultures, uh, political, cultural and social practices, so it's very eclecticism, it's attractive. It's about bodies, sounds, visuals, rhythm, text, mobilities, technologies, um, specific relationships to time but also to place and there's something about inner and outer worlds going on as well that we're interested in and rave itself is a site for learning um, it's a site for developing it's a site for personal and collective transformation 
So if we're looking at ways to get to grip with all get to grips with all of that, then it's also about finding an appropriate method or an appropriate, uh, appropriate approach to that. So we're also interested in rave history for the method it allows us to explore and develop, and and then thinking about actually how this might be ways of doing other types of history as well. So it might it might trickle over and bleed over into other areas of our work. So to get to get grips with rave and post rave history, we need a range of perspectives that capture that very multifaceted nature that I've just described. So these perspectives should be collaborative. They should challenge received ideas. They, they should be mind altering, altering in some way. They should be eclectic, um, so across disciplines. We got, to, we got to interpret emotion, feeling, word, image, space, relationships, networks, technologies, stories. So we, We've got to have many tools to do that, to, to interpret all, all these different types of uh, evidence and, and different forms. Our, our method has to span the biographical or even the autobiographical, as well as the collective and the social. And, you know, we might as well admit here that we are all ravers and that's an important part of the story. And then it also has to incorporate some reflection on what it means to learn. What does it mean to be transformed, to become a different person? So there's some kind of pedagogy involved here. So that's the, the rationale for post-rave history. It is both content and method simultaneously. So now we're moving to the main part of this panel, which is about the illustration of how we, we sought to bring this together. And this is in the context of a, a, a final year module that we have delivered to uh, history students now for going on seven or eight years. Initially, it was called Post Punk Britain, and then we moved the story forward to account for a different time period, and it's now called Post Rave Britain. And at the end of the module in, in March and April, we've always sought to end with a kind of collaborative project which brings together in a single opportunity uh, uh, an uh, a chance for students to apply the learning. So what are, how do our students apply the skills and techniques they've learned, they've developed from their encounters with post-rape history to a collaborative project with a specific outcome? So in this case, this year, we had a, a, a we call this phase of the, the module DIT Digital, do it together rather than do it yourself. Do it together is more collective than uh, the kind of rather individualistic do it yourself. And we added the suffix in the field, and I'll explain what in the field means uh, um, and, and why there's an emphasis on the digital as well. But in this case, we had a task of um, developing a community history event as, as part of the R Place strand of the Brighton Festival. And this was uh, our brief was supplied by John, the storyteller, or John Mason, um, whose goal was to produce an interactive story based event that would engage local school age children, primary school age children with the history of their locality, with their area, and more specifically with the area of Hangleton, which is a, a suburb of Brighton. Now, given the context that we're working in the pandemic and, and when the commission was given, it wasn't at all clear that the festival could organize any in-person events at all. We were told to develop uh, simultaneously an event that could be live, but that was also accessible uh, digitally. Um, so it had to be simultaneously analog and digital, I suppose. Now, uh, we, we use this suffix in the field because we, at the outset of the project, we didn't, we decided that being in the field, whether digitally or in an analog sense, in the real sense of being there, was an important way of exploring how things take shape, how things develop, because they develop in time in a precise relation to the place where they develop. And we thought that was quite appropriate for a rave, you know, the notion of being in a field and having an event happen that takes its tempo and its rhythm and its uh, sense of shape and uh, perspective and being directly from the, the field in which it, it takes place. So I'm now um, gonna reintroduce the panel because they have um, a specific role that they all played uh, in this collaborative project. So I'm going to start with Jack, uh, Jack O'Connor. So Jack is a, a, a PhD student um, in the, uh, at the University of Sussex working on a, his own sort of history research project. But he was involved in the module because he is, uh, as part of a learning to teach uh, program, uh, our current PhD students were uh, acting as mentors for our undergraduate students. 
So Jack was directly involved in the project in terms of mentoring and developing the group work that our students did. Um, so I'm going to ask you, Jack, first. So given the brief that we are presented with, it had to have something to do with Hangleton, this area of Brighton. And it had to have something to do with history in a given field, with the field being kind of a metaphor, but also an actual place. How, when you were working with groups, how did they start to narrow this brief down into something that they could actually get going with? Yeah, so <clears throat> it was it was kind of the sort of the move between the big group and, and the small group that I think aided that. So initially, initially that big group discussion about the that concept of in the field or, or in a field, it produced sort of varied and interesting ideas such as, you know, field as a site of history, how it's occupied in different ways, centre and periphery, space and place, and a field containing layers of history and, and, and linking that to archaeology perhaps. Um, and these ideas were very much then taken into the group research. So in the groups, the students and the mentors initially set out to understand Hangleton, but just locating it geog geographically um, in relation to also their own experience of Brighton and Hope. Not everyone knew where Hangleton was, you know, not everyone had visited it either. Um, and then from there, we explored its history by examining the digital sources available, because as you explained, we were sort of all working online. Um, and immediately though, the groups began to form ideas and themes sort of, again, generating from in the field um, and then linking that to the historical source analysis and also the brief that, that John had given us. Um, so one group had a theme on under the ground, which was sort of geological, geographical, um, looked at the layers of history approach, explored sort of excavations, archaeology, burials, lost characters, geology. Um, and then another group uh, explored Hangleton through sites of place they that were used by inhabitants over time, also dwellings through time, sort of who lived there and why, and also routeways that had passed through Hangleton over, over sort of thousands of years. What was, what was the effect of working collaboratively on this, would you say? Well, from, from the first moment that we split into groups, I mean, you, you could see that we had a multitude of different skills and perspectives and voices and interests, which certainly helped build a diverse and varied history of Hangleton. Um, people were creative. There was sort of drawing of mind maps, sketching out story ideas, linking it to John's um, stories and also how we might use it on Twine. And, and then we were posting that to Padlet to build up our ideas to share digitally. Um, student brought concepts, concepts from the post Ray Britain module and the skills they had learned. So play and festivity, for example, as identified early on um, in one of the, in, in amongst the sources we analyzed by what certainly by one group member, which then enabled the group to deploy, to deploy their rave method, methodologies and to understand the notion of play and affirm the value of sort of self-produced autonomous sources. And then I, I had the opportunity to sort of mentor and work across both research groups. So it's great to see how the sort of themes and ideas and sources and, and potential storylines that everyone was thinking about were eventually sort of brought together initially on the Padlets and then how they were sort of theorised and conceptualised um, sort of using ideas of rural history, layers of history, carnival and the countryside. And then we presented that to John. So it was clear, you know, at the end from seeing both, both sides of the groups that there was a multitude of voices in there. Thanks, Jack. I think that's really helpful. Cause it, and I, I, I too was struck by the sheer imagination that emerged out of uh, uh, the groups and, and the way they approached something that they didn't necessarily know about before, but they brought the themes from post-rape history to apply to this uh, topic and, and this task. And it, it really was dynamic, uh, the group uh, effect there, I think. I'm going to move on to, to Daniel now, because uh, Daniel Whitaker Wallace, who's uh, currently doing an MA in contemporary history, also one, acted as one of our mentors, so he was working alongside students. But he had, you ended up playing quite a specific role in shaping how the, all this research material that was pulled together by our students was then moulded into a story, because you played a lead role in in, in uh, getting it into shape for the storytelling app Twine, which is a, a digital uh, way of uh, presenting stories through choices, essentially. Can you sort of tell us something about how you got involved in that and how that worked out in practice for you? Yeah, so I kind of took on the role of actually building the digital software and building a sort of template for the story, which would then take us through the different sections and would lead you back to certain places. But I think, again, returning to the idea of working collaboratively, um, we kind of had these two processes going on where John and the group would map out the story on paper and kind of look at what, where we wanted to take it. And then I would try and kind of replicate that through the software and then obviously kind of 
came up across uh, certain hurdles where things were too complex in the coding and stuff like that, and then kind of had to feed that back into the um, the creative process, which then shaped the story as well. So it was, I thought it was really interesting seeing kind of how the process and the content shaped the digital form, but then also how the digital form and those limitations then shaped the the actual story itself. Um, and then when we got to the point of uh, just putting all the content into the template, it was just a case of basically just playing it and just playing it through and then seeing what kind of worked and what didn't. Um, and then we're kind of like, I'd play it and pass it on to other people who then play it and feedback. So I was thinking of returning to this idea of like content and method um, and actually just play. The idea of play was really important in that final stage. Um, and then reflecting on the whole thing, it kind of actually play seemed really important to the whole thing and like the whole process of doing the research and bringing it together and playing around with different characters and storylines. So I think looking at method and actually, actually, you know, taking play into that research is really important in building that. So it, that would be your takeaway in terms of, because thinking about how we're trying to connect history, storytelling and place, that, that that's the thread that connects it to you. Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. And in terms of place, yeah, just thinking about like the places that research was happening and it was really, there was this really diverse range of places going on, like you had everyone in their bedrooms, you had Hangleton, which was kind of like the subject place, um, you had the field, the kind of metaphorical space and then like the digital space. So it's really made me think of kind of the actual surroundings of where the research is happening. Um, and just ideas such of like immersive research and stuff like that, and whether being sort of physically close to the place you're in that you're researching has an effect on the research you're doing. Um, and kind of whether that kind of sensory engagement and experience of the thing that you're studying then affects you in a certain ways and, and how you're doing it. Um, which I think is kind of shown by like Jeremy Deller as well and, and everybody in the place when he kind of brings the uh, or the, the synthesizers and stuff like that. And then it sort of like everyone engages people with that kind of sonic experience and that like physical engagement with it. So I think, yeah, just it made, made me think a lot about the places that we're doing the research as, as well as the place that you're researching. So, so which is very timely, of course, because of the, the, the digital environment that we're working in, which actually um, I want to bring John in at this point, really, because uh, I guess originally you you were hoping that this might be a, an in-person live storytelling event that would be involved moving physically around a neighbourhood. But that in the end wasn't we weren't able to to deliver that. But instead, we have you did the, the live storytelling events over Zoom. And then we have the Twine uh, version of it, which is permanently accessible via our, our, our website. But I did, from your point of view, um, what we, what do you think you were expecting at the start? And then, you know, at the end of the thing, how, how did that meet those expectations or change those expectations? Well, I suppose um, uh, they, there's always, a, a, with projects like this, there's an element of uncertainty at the start because uh, we, we're asking a lot of work from the students involved that they are given this brief um, to from scratch from an absolute standing start find out about the history of an area that they don't necessarily know anything about and because it's an outlying suburb of Brighton and Hove it's not a very well trodden place that that people who haven't lived here for a long time would necessarily know about um, and and knowing that we've got this this particular date period um, at the end of the project when the festival are expecting something to be delivered um, and but but it was an absolute dream in practice it was it was such a joy everybody um, put so much into it and and just like it's been said you could tell that people were enjoying just playing with the ideas and it wasn't just about dryly regurgitating facts that have been uncovered it was about how do we interpret these how do we draw connections between them um in in terms of this semi-fictional story um that's going to be exciting and, and and tell people something interesting about the place um and and i think it, it worked wonderfully so as a storyteller you found it creatively um... oh so, so very much so yeah and, and one of the great things about this so having done sort of similar projects with dit digital in previous years is that you, you might think that there's only so much that can be found out out about a particular locality and while I suppose on paper that's true, there's 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 enough there that people always find out different things. And so the actual end event 
turns out being completely different every time and so that is really stimulating and exciting as a as a as a performer you know it's great to have um something fresh to 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 bring to to an audience every time which is great thanks so i'm going to bring in uh, our last panelist and perhaps the most important one of all because Alyssa uh, has just finished her undergraduate degree with us and was a key part of the uh, student group that did all the work and you you did all sorts of different things so i guess what would you say you took out from it at the end of it all this or what did you get out of this i think really it was the first time i worked with brief um i think a lot of time at sussex where we have a lot of creative license with what modules we pick and what we devise a lot of our essay titles i've tended to do a lot of contemporary history that is feminist or very gendered so it was quite nice having a brief where i was kind of told where to look at um i was given an exact place i was given a time um but i also had quite a lot of creative license at the same time but it wasn't just me where it was i think especially with covid we had the risks everything being online to have quite a disconnected group where i think especially the dit digital project it was quite nice all of us being together bouncing off ideas um yeah, and it was just nice to work together and you didn't feel as isolated in a time where we I hadn't actually met any of the people in my seminar group who I'd spent the last year with. So it was a nice project to do with a brief, which kind of combined everyone's ideas and you could bounce off each other. So you've mentioned that you brought something very specific yourself that you clearly emerged with as a particular type of historian uh, working in particular areas. So you also have your dissertation research, which sets you up as this particular type of historian. Can you tell us a bit about that work and how, how we get that connected with the DIT digital project? Yeah, so my dissertation, I looked at the risky pleasures that women experience in the 1990s rave scene. So I looked at the fashion that they wore, um, the sexual encounters they experienced and the subsequent historical representation of female ravers and female scholars that document them and how a lot of the time they're quite unremembered. Um, and to be honest, there isn't much content wise related to Hangleton and I don't know, Reebok trainers that women were wearing that I was talking about my dissertation. But the way that I approach history was very similar. I think the idea of DIT Digital was very ravey in the sense of it's doing things together, it's being a collective body. And I really tried to embrace that in my dissertation in kind of creating a subcultural ravey way of doing history and I think a big part of that is the rave seems so like toxic it goes in between the mainstream and the subcultural quite messily and I tried to embody that in my dissertation and go in between third and first person I didn't want to make it a comfortable read because what I was talking about wasn't necessarily that com like comfortable we shouldn't it was at times it was like, like rape culture and all that kind of thing so I think DIT Digital, it just showed that it's not just what we were saying before about the content of Rave, it's how we can approach the way that we write, even the kind of maybe I, at times I use italics that didn't necessarily fit in, but it shouldn't have to fit in because subcultural doesn't really fit in. That's the whole point of it. So I think it's that we can use this type of history as a way of doing it and not just something to study. So that, I think you've highlighted two things there. The riskiness of the venture. It could all go horribly wrong and fall flat on its face. Oh, yeah. No one could turn <laughs> up. And then the disruptiveness, the, the idea that this could be a disruptive way of not just doing rave history, but doing history more generally. So I, I, that's a really great way to sum up our panel, I think, and to pass back to Ben, who's going to introduce the next segment. Thanks, everyone. Nice one. Thanks, Chris. So I won't do formal introductions. I'll just pass over to my colleague, Malcolm, and leave that to him. Hey, Malcolm. Hi, hi Ben. Um, thanks, everyone, for that as well. That was amazing to hear. Um, so I'm also, I'm a lecturer in um, media and cultural studies in, in Mar, and I'm going to start off with a story as well. Um, I grew up in and around small towns in Hertfordshire five buses a day to two places you don't want to go kind of places. Places where you look at someone wrong in the pub and they'd be offering you out moments later. I couldn't wait to leave. And the call to leave was everywhere. Jazz, skate culture, hip hop, older brothers mixtapes, older sisters stories of club nights, trips to White Hart Lane. These all provided journeys to elsewhere, to a London town 25 miles down the road, and to my mind, the rest of the world. Only a, few, um, only a few miles south of my parents' house, the chalk architecture of the Thames Basin 
opened onto a world, opened onto that world and onto jungle pirate radio transmissions. A few years later, driving into town, the interior space of a red Nissan Micra was sonically transformed by Rude FM. Yeah, don't forget, competition's still running for Moondance. You can win yourself a pair of tickets, that's you plus one. For Moondance New Year's Eve, SE1. Just tell me one DJ from the roof crew who's going to be representing down there in Edson Sachi Arena. We've got all those with your name in the hat so far. Out to Martin over there in Stratford. We've got Mike in Tottenham. I'll talk to Robin Croydon, Lee in Deptford, and the Blends as well. Fire I'm popping off. Inbox full. If you're waiting for your text, hold tight. Just gonna clear some messages. We've got the 7 double four. Those journeys ended in at trance, techno, um, house, um, club nights, but our staple for some time was free parties. Warehouses, old cinemas and derelict care homes were converted each weekend into pleasure domes. A call to the free party telephone lines would lead to secret locations, sometimes um, in cat and mouse with the law. Inside you'd find massive sound systems. We'd often end at the jungle sets, but we'd start at the acid techno systems where we knew some of the crew. The sonic atmosphere of those places made me feel out of this world, very definitely out of Hertfordshire. The ease helped, of course, but it was not all about that. It was much more. You felt one with the massive, moving together, people from different walks of life, charged by the pounding bass lines, and machinic chipping tops and hats, but with the same purpose, imagining something bigger, something anti-something, fuck the police, fuck the system, and then back to the dance. That hype, that vibe, is sonic intimacy and it is the subject of a book that I've just written about by the same name that appropriately for this panel is for the ravers. Sonic intimacy then is the relational coming together of sound, sound technology and society. It is the condition of intimate co-presence, intimate proximity, that feeling of wholeness and depth. Sonic intimacy is the intimate embrace, intimate space, and that shared feeling of something both bigger than you and that journey to something bottomless. That is what the book is about and, that is, and, it, and it is about why sonic intimacy matters and how it is changing. But the book isn't about me and it isn't a melancholic book either. Rather, the book is about why our intimate relationship with sound matters, how that relationship has changed for better and worse over the last 50 years and what is at stake in that. Ask any music fan what they like about a good music event and they will tell you about the energy, the buzz, the feeling, the aura, the vibe. It's deeply meaningful, but at the same time, not very well understood. We are more accustomed to analyze language, social structures and technology, but not really the substance that flows between. And so we miss out. To tell the story of sonic intimacy, the book engages with reggae and dub sound systems of the 1970s and 80s, Jungle Pirate Radio of the 1990s, which we've just heard a bit of, and grime YouTube music videos of the 2010s. 
Put another way, it is interested in the vibe of the reggae sound system, the hype of Jungle Pirate Radio and the grime of YouTube. It is interested in these forms of sonic intimacy because as forms of popular culture, they are both archetypical to the mainstream and alternative energies of their times, as we've just been hearing. They're also, of course, black diasporic sound cultures, part of a political and sonic history in which freedom has been conveyed sonically. This is a complex story, but we can initially think about it in terms of the shift between a black diasporic sound culture produced um, an expressive of a largely black Caribbean society in the UK, that sound systems, to a black diasporic sound culture produced and productive of a black and multi-ethnic working class massive in which sound is still foremost, and that's Jungle Pirate Radio. To a black diasporic sound culture produced and expressive of the multi-ethnic city in which the visual is foremost, and which sound is racially recoded on the screen. As Belgian research address, addresses in more detail, these sound cultures and their antecedents are also masculine and patriarchal. So what are the big themes of the book? Well, we have the changing relationship between the sonic and visual culture and why that matters. We have an evaluation of the extent to which sound cultures are captured in or exceed racism and capitalist domination. We have to a lesser extent in the book, um, a discussion of masculinity, um, femininity and black diasporic sound cultures, and we have an assessment of the transformation of alternative forms of mutuality, expression, wisdom, craft, and why they matter. But the book's driving argument is that the sonic intimacies of, of reggae sound system, jungle pirate radio, grime YouTube music videos are important because through them, in this time of racist, authoritarian, and nationalist assertion, we can hear the alternative flows and imaginings of human life. Thank you very much. I'm going to um, pass over to Baljit, who's going to talk a bit more about this. Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Baljit and I'm a third year PhD student in cultural studies. Um, my talk today is going to be based on my ethnographic research at a youth club in East London, where I've been looking at young people's engagement in music production as a way of developing resilience and resistance to experiences of victimization. So here I will be focusing on the ways in which young women are often invalidated and excluded from the music studio as a male dominated space, and more specifically from engaging in rap as a male dominated musical form. To open up this talk, I'm going to start with a short vignette. Tuesday the 16th of July 2019 marked the week before the summer holidays. Bass Youth Club were transitioning from their usual term time music programmes to promoting its summer programmes. On this particular day, Bass Youth Club was being used as a venue for the finale of Coming Through UK, which was described on its Twitter page as a talent show for up and coming musicians with an urban focus. The talent show was largely for an outside group of artists welcoming music in the genres of grime, rap, hip hop, drill, and reggae. 15 of Bass's young people had gotten through from hundreds of applicants, but none were successful in being voted into the finale. Capital One Extra's Robert Bruce presented the show and the panel of judges comprised of industry professionals, including Getz, Merkston, and Posty and Bernie Mack from Grime Daily. Nandy was the only female judge. The lights dipped as the artists prepared for their performances. The mobile stage was accompanied with two mics and to the side was a laptop from which the DJ ran playlists before and in between each performance. Using my phone when I could, I captured at least 15 tracks that comprised the playlist. The artists included 50 Cent, Freestyle, J Huss, Mr Easy, Jay-Z, Skepta, Giggs and Young Jeezy. Faith Evans was one of the only female artists featuring on a track with Freeway. From the presenters and judges to the finalists and the selected artists playing through the laptop, I noted how male dominated the event was and the sheer underrepresentation of female artists. I turned to Lawrence Denoska, the music program facilitators and for this event, the light and sound organizers, as they continued setting up equipment and asked whether any female music artists had gotten through to the finals of the talent show. Oscar responded, 
Yeah, I think one or two MCs followed by, sorry, Bell, looks like it's a man's world. The feeling of sonic intimacy that Malcolm talks about existed in these spaces and at these events. I watched as young men's music created the feelings of rush, energy, the vibe and hype. It wasn't just the sound, but the way they used their bodies, one hand on the mic while they jumped and danced from one side of the stage to another, from the stage to the front row of the audience and back to the stage again, this time calling up the other performers to collectively dance, pumping fists in the air, gesturing guns, all hyping up the final seconds of a grime or reggae track. At another event, there was so much energy and hype that one of the male performers started doing press-ups on the floor as the audience applauded his mate for his performance. There was a sense of togetherness, oneness and collectivity in these moments. But fewer young women were part of this togetherness and collectivity, even if they shared the commonality of enjoying the same music, the same artists and the same cause, the something anti-something as Malcolm referred to. In a similar fashion to the young men, some of the young women also used their music to tell these stories of fuck the feds and fuck the system. But in the music studio, I was told that it was a different type of energy that often excluded and invalidated the presence and the talents of young female artists. Ash, for instance, a young Bengali singer, described the music studio as very testosterone filled. She told me, you can smell it as soon as you come in like a pit bull. It's like crack. Ruby, a young black rapper, described the studio as having a different energy because it's all just boys, she said. If you were to go there by yourself, you just feel like you won't fit in. And it wasn't that they weren't welcomed, but once the young women were in these spaces, they felt uncomfortable and judged because they were young women. And subsequently, their abilities to rap and perform in the same way were brought into question performing to prove themselves rather than performing for enjoyment as the young men did. Ruby added here, I feel like when a female says she's a rapper, people think it's a joke, but when it's a boy, they'll take it seriously. And as for female rappers, the boys thought it was just for fun. There was also a feeling of intimidation. Younger girls like 13 year old Ruby felt the older boys had far more confidence and experience and subsequently felt like they weren't good enough or were not at their stage. On other occasions, young women like Ash felt compelled to appease the young men by asking them what they thought of her music, even though she told me she knew she smacks and described appeasing them in this way as disgusting and hating it. Important to note was that this feeling of hype and energy that existed in this space between the four walls of the music studio, the sounds of grime, drill and Afro beats playing from the speakers and young men competing for who had the best bars also existed alongside their demonstrations of symbolic violence. For instance, I'd observed a young man um, dancing to music whilst gesturing a gun in the face of a young woman, despite her repeated requests to stop. Additionally, it existed alongside lyrics that objectified and sexualized young women and were still perpetrated violence against them. For example, one young man had written lyrics to a drill track stating that he would push a pregnant woman down the stairs so that she would miscarry. The raps and music produced by young women were only validated if they mirrored masculinist aesthetics and masculinist ideals of excellence and competitiveness or violence that was associated with a certain status such as gun or knife crime. These things added something to your brand or to your label, even if you weren't all that, I was told. But they weren't validated if they were to talk about violence against women, and in particular, the domestic or sexual violence which the youth club frequently received cases for. Or mental health, for example, because as Ash told me, it's just not a trend. Ultimately, what the young women conveyed during their interviews was as much about fuck the patriarchy as it was about fuck the police and fuck the system. And without the recognition of this in the music studios, the togetherness and oneness was only open insofar that it included young men and excluded young women. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bowjit. Um, so I'm gonna talk um, about a project I'm working on, um, and then I'm going to pass over to. Well, I'm going to show a pre-record of, of um, a colleague and current Sussex student, um, 
Jamila Prowse. Okay, I'm just going to share screen. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Um, so I am talk I am going to talk about Rave, but this is Walter Benjamin, uh, the German philosopher, because uh, I also want to talk about history. And I think parts of what I want to talk about chime with lots of what have been said already. So this is a project I'm working on at the moment, uh, funded by the Paul Mellon Centre. So thanks to the Paul Mellon Centre um, about uh, British art uh, made or art made in Britain uh, from the period of about 1994 and the Criminal Justice Bill or Criminal Justice Act through to 2018, uh, which is the 30th anniversary of the so-called Second Summer of Love. So it's kind of roughly 25 year period. Um, and it looks at artworks that look back at what has been kind of uh, popularly enshrined as the kind of high point of UK rave culture in you know, 1988 through to about 1992, 93, 94. Um, so why am I showing you Walter Benjamin? Well, I, I wanted to refer to, it's a, it's a really famous essay that lots of people will be familiar with in which he talks about um, the philosophy of history, the activity of, 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 of writing or narrating or kind of telling history or historical stories. Um, and the kind of crucial observation in the context of my study is, is that history is not some uh, rigid, fixed, pre-existent entity uh, where one event follows another event, follows another event um, like beads on an abacus. But rather history is a constellation um, or uh, the past, events in the past um, get drawn together as configurations you know, as he, he calls them constellations, um, which are not fixed, they're changing um, and they emerge uh, particularly vividly or, or legibly um, at particular moments. So first of all, you know, when we look back at the past, we create these configurations of events, um, but as a consequence, um, Specific histories, and this is the kind of core observation in that essay, specific histories often tell us as much about the present as they do about the past or about the past presents. When different histories were being uh, formulated and propagated um, and with, with, with kind of varying degrees of, of um, varying degrees of, of I guess, uh, kind of success or, or failure or, or, or kind of currency that they're provided with at particular moments. And so in essence, that's what my project is about, right? That's the kind of theoretical framework for the project is I'm looking at lots and lots of, of works of art that have been made across that 25 year period that in one way or another provide a kind of, a way of understanding that moment, that kind of energy flash uh, in the late eighties, early nineties. Um, and they do it by creating these different configurations around rave. That's kind of my main argument is that they situate that moment uh, within a number of different constellations. And in looking at the different constellations within which these different works of art situate rave culture, we can also start to learn something about the different historical circumstances, the social, cultural, political, economic context within which these different works of art and exhibitions were staged. And so really the book relies on this series of dialogues between works of art that look back to an earlier moment uh, and in looking back to an earlier moment, situate it in relationship to lots of other moments. Um, but at the same time, I'm interested in the moment that the looking back takes place from and, and what those dialogues suggest. Um, so the book itself is involved in the creation of, of a further set of constellations, if you will. Um, and in that sense, 
I guess it's also a kind of idiosyncratic history of Britain after Thatcher in terms of you know, my, my the historical period that concerns me is not just the late 80s, early 90s, uh, the kind of endpoint of Thatcherism, but I'm interested in, in what unfolds in the 25 years afterwards. Um, so I'll in, um, this is just to kind of, I'm conscious of, of um, talking about kind of the gendering of rave. I, you could make very obvious comments about the gendering of my reading list uh, in, in this context. Um, I've put this in as a kind of useful analogy, I guess, for, for the way I'm studying things. So on the left hand side of the slide, there's lots of um, kind of popular histories of rave culture. On the right hand side of the slide, there's some kind of popular cultural histories of the period um, after uh, that kind of high point of rave. And in a sense, my project kind of tries to situate one in relationship to another. OK, so I'm going to do show three, three examples really quickly to give a kind of more palpable, tangible sense of what what this kind of looks like in practice and then offer just a very quick thought about uh, the implications of my approach to this subject for the way I'm actually writing the book. So this is a still from Mark Leckie's 1999 project, Fiorucci Made Me Hardcore, which uh, there's a book just being published about it last year in which the author kind of notes that this is like everybody's favorite contemporary artwork. So Leckie uh, produced, it's a video montage uh, made out up entirely of, of kind of found footage. And so this is kind of pre-internet work. So it, it, it required an extraordinary amount, amount of research to even access this footage. And it kind of takes us uh, through a journey of, of um, UK subcultures um, that begins with um, Northern Soul, uh, moves through casuals into acid house and then rave um, and and it's stitched together out of all of these uh, all of this footage taken inside uh, venues primarily of people dancing um, it's it's a really trippy hallucinogenic disorientating sometimes quite disturbing film where the kind of sound uh, is, is put together out of these kind of uh, warping mutating samples uh, the the edit uh, kind of twitches and ticks uh, in ways that are kind of in sync or, or take its lead from the bodies. Um, but in terms of the constellation that's being formulated, it's, it's about UK subcultures. So in terms of the context I'm situating that work in, Leckie's been really explicit about the fact he moved to America uh, in part to get away from uh, what he thought was a really kind of parochial and reactionary form of nostalgia manifest in part in young British art, but particularly in Britpop, right? This kind of repackaging of, of a kind of so-called swinging 60s London um, that was very easily co-opted by a new Labour project. Um, and he felt that this much more recent, much more energetic, much more future focused part of UK culture was being kind of totally neglected in the context of the late 90s, despite the fact it, it was only kind of six years ago when it was was kind of at a high point um, and he thought that was to do with class so kind of using Leckie's work as a route into a discussion about new labor its cultural arm and, and class this is an example kind of related example uh, it's Laura Oldfield Ford's Savage Messiah so this is a zine she made uh, during 2010 2005 to 2010 and she goes in these kind of drifts through what were kind of liminal spaces in London uh, in search of uh, a kind of alternative or, or a kind of mo modes of resistance, these kind of spectres, whether they're kind of material or immaterial spectres that kind of haunted London at a point when it was being kind of relentlessly gentrified under the kind of late second, third term of New Labour. So all of these uh, spaces that had played host to uh, parties, raves, squats, that was slowly uh, being kind of transformed into this kind of CGI vision of corporate sameness. Uh, and she uh, uses those drifts as the basis for these zines that kind of in formal terms very much kind of situate rave in relationship to punk, uh, in relationship to other subcultures through the kind of aesthetics of the zine. Last example, I guess maybe if, if Leckie's is everyone's favorite contemporary art, but maybe, maybe Dell is everybody in the place would give it a run for its money. So this was uh, made in 2018 by the UK artist, Jeremy Della. 
a lot of people know it, in which he kind of delivers a, a, a kind of a cultural history class, in essence, uh, to a group of A-level politics students in London, uh, and with Rave as, as its topic. Uh, and the historical constellations, I mean, this absolutely exemplifies the idea of the constellation insofar as Rave is situated in relation to black and queer cultures in America, in relationship to kind of UK countercultures, uh, traveller scenes, he goes on to talk about the kind of fallout of the Cold War, the shift from an industrial to a post-industrial economy, different uses of factories. It's a kind of rich and complex story um, that he kind of animates or, or, or narrates through images and objects. Um, the thing I want to stress here in terms of those historical constellations is the site specificity of this story, right? He situates it in a, in a sixth form history class. Um, and I, in that sense, it's very much about what the past means in the present and, and what it could yet mean in the future, insofar as these young people are a kind of signifier of, of, of a world that is still emerging. Um, so the final thing I want to say is, is, so in terms of how I'm going to structure the book, it can't be like beads on an abacus. It's not going to be a kind of chronological uh, movement uh, through that 30 years. Um, and what you see there is the kind of constellations I'm beginning to formulate myself with each of these artworks kind of constituting a bead uh, or actually constituting a star. And, and part of the project now involves kind of structuring these in such a way that kind of constellations come into focus for me. Okay. So I'm gonna now pass over to Jamila. Uh, so I'm gonna have to share screen again, bear with me. Hi, um, I'm Jamila Prowse. Um, I'm an artist, writer and curator based in London. And I'm gonna talk you through some research that I did between 2017 and 19. Uh, about um, dance and club cultures. Um, so I'm just gonna start sharing my screen here. So you can see it. Great. Um, so um, kind of starting with uh, an essay that I wrote for um, PhotoWorks, which is a photography organization uh, based in Brighton. Uh, the, the essay was published in their 2018 annual. Um, and it looked at uh, blackness uh, and the possibilities of looking at blackness through a kind of lens of multiplicity and abundance in relation to dance and club cultures. So what I did was took um, a theory developed by the artist Evan Ifakoya in their 2018 show Ritual Without Belief at Gasworks, in which Evan talks about the idea of blackness being contextualized in the arts through a kind of lens of scarcity or lack or as something that is marginal and the need to actually look at blackness through a lens of abundance and multiplicity as well and joy um, and Evan works within sort of club cultures and dance anyway so I, I kind of extended their theorizing to um, another two artists to think about dance and movement as a kind of ideal site for this multiplicity to exist because of the kind of freedom of expression that comes through dance and clubs as a kind of safe setting for um, people from marginalized identities to be in a space together, to hold safe spaces together and just to really be unencumbered uh, within that space. So I did so looking at the work of uh, Rona McKenzie, which is the work here on the left, um, which is a, an untitled series from 2018 of a series of black women dancing in their homes. So like home videos that they made and shared with Ronan of them dancing. And this uh, this kind of um, split screen that you see here is of uh, Ronan's contr contribution to the series. And then the series that I looked at on the right is uh, Benice Malenga's uh, ongoing archival series, Friends on Film, uh, in which Benice documents um, their um, experiences and friends within club settings and their kind of close relation to club culture in London through uh, club groups such as Babes. 
So then uh, that essay ended up being the jumping off point for an exhibition that I curated with um, the director of Photo Work Show Air in 2019 at Peckham 24, which is a three day festival that takes place in Copeland Park. Um, and we wanted to expand on these ideas a bit more around uh, like dance being a, a space for freedom of expression, clubs being a space for people to kind of come together in community and like how to use those ideas to create a more sort of inclusive open space within an art setting which can sometimes be a bit more uh, exclusive and stuffy and like, you know, thinking of white walled galleries, that kind of thing. Um, so as you can see from this photo, um, we displayed these bespoke um, screens that were kind of hung from the uh, rafters of a warehouse uh, in Copeland Park. And they were double sided screens so you could see the image from whichever side you were standing from and they were, you could, they were at the height that you could kind of walk directly underneath them. This is Benice's work that was displayed on like large poster paper in the space to kind of mimic the way that um, club posters might be displayed throughout city spaces. Um, and then I'm just going to talk you through some of the, the works in the show. So this is a, a work uh, by an artist called Lottie Anderson called um, Dance Therapy, in which the artist set up uh, what she called capture parties, where she would invite people into a space and film them dancing on screen. And the idea was to look at the kind of group dynamics that exist within club spaces, within kind of spaces with movement. Um, and those are then translated into large scale multi-channel video installations. So you can see uh, Lottie's work on display here, actually in the show. Um, so another work that was in the show was uh, this uh, contribution by Amar Edawira, who is actually the um, creative director of Boiler Room's film channel, Boiler Room being um, a platform that, that very much exists around club culture, uh, started filming sort of DJ sets and, and uploading them online and it's really expanded out. So Amar runs the uh, like bespoke film arm of Boiler Room. And he made this, uh, this film called The Final Night of Paradise Garage, which took um, recovered footage from uh, a really infamous Soho New York club called Bar Paradise Garage, which ran from the late 70s to the uh, late 80s, closing in 1987. Um, and re soundtracked the footage because when it was found, um, it was completely silent and then displayed it across a kind of nine screen multi channel video um, to mirror sort of CCTV footage in clubs. Um, this is a work by an artist called Rebecca Salvadori called Lillian's Vow. It's a 2019 work that was displayed for the first time within the show, um, which uh, was a kind of archival and collaborative film made with the artist Lillian Hatpour with a round of performance she made called Choreophobia, which looked at Middle Eastern male dance practices that existed in public to begin with, but were criminalized in 1979 in many places, including Tehran, and then kind of very much went underground. And Lillian reinterprets this uh, male dance through uh, two female dancers and also the influence of her having a cross-cultural cross background between the Middle East and um, North England uh, by having these sonic references to Northern baseline that exists throughout the work. So the film that um, Rebecca made uh, uses documentation from the performances with audio recordings of conversations between Liam and her mom uh, of translating uh, some of the words that they're, they're talking about the work using um, to create this kind of non chronological document. This is a work called um, Dance State by an artist called Marie Barrett, um, which is a 1989 work based on uh, research that Marie did um, 
at the height of the troubles in Derry, uh, it was a collaboration with Derry Council in which uh, Marie found that the most frequented buildings between 1988 and 89 were the job center and a club called Squires. Um, so Marie made this three minute looped video which combined text and soundscape with images of army helicopters, surveillance, cameras, taxi drivers and locals to reflect this kind of surreal nature of nightlife in the city. Um, and the actual original file of the video was lost by the time we were curating the show, which is not something we knew going into it. So instead of displaying the film itself, we just uh, had this still um, printed in the space uh, in the same kind of uh, format as club flyers uh, as a way to, again, sort of mirror that club paraphernalia. Um, so Within the uh, opening night of the uh, show, we invited a uh, South London music collective called Touching Bass, uh, who started by running these kind of nights in South London uh, and then a further across London where they would have a kind of hotline where they would text everyone. This is in you know the past sort of five or so years. So like mimicking those early organizing factors of clubbing. Uh, taking away social media from it and also having a kind of no phones policy on the dance floor and touching base have a really dedicated following now so inviting them meant that we really got that that feel and the the kind of authenticity for um, like club organizing in South London today um, and also managed to create this kind of blurring between the um, the works that that were displayed as you can see here like on those screens and then people actually dancing directly underneath them so as you can see in this this video from the night you get this really kind of energetic um experience of the space um and this complete reflection of like works that are documenting and reinterpreting club cultures and then that that existing in real time in the space uh, by kind of hosting a party. Yeah, so that just gives you a little bit of an idea about some of the, the stuff we were looking at through the show. Um, okay, thank you. Awesome, thanks Jamila. So Lucy, are you there? Yeah, I am. Well, that's so exciting. Um, we imagine this is a sort of starting point of recognising the constellations, actually, that some of which we find out about accidentally, some of which we find out, um, you know, more, in a more kind of work setting or people inviting each other to participate in teaching and seminars and stuff. I thought I'd just talk through some of the things that have just struck me as constellations or correlations in the discussion. And while I'm doing that, if anyone's got any questions or thoughts, put them in the Q&A and I'll be able to pick them up. This is definitely, I think, a starting point of something that we really want to continue. And what I'm really excited of and really proud of is that what's absolutely at the forefront of the discussion that we've had is about Raver's process and Raver's method, not about nostalgic stories about Castle Morton or the, you know, the, 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 the standard narrative. In fact, what we've got is a really lovely sense of how disruptive we can be with the narrative of Rave that we've already been given. And I think that's really important. Um, I think you know, some of the things that really emerged across the piece for me were thinking about the quite uncomfortable relationship between the self and the collective um, over time, but also in the moment. And, and th there's some complicity there, I think, between individuals and the collective, but also that the individual narrative can disrupt, can disrupt a more comfortable narrative of rave and I think what we produce collectively today is a really is a, is um, a haunting of rave and something you know, being haunted by rave but not in a kind of comfortable way that there is some things that rave needs to be called to account for I guess um, one of the other things I thought was really interesting is thinking about rave time um, and rave as a learning space rave as a form of curation including as Jamila pointed out things that didn't get captured which I think is really important um, I really, you know, picking up on some of the emotionality, the politics of the emotionality around intimacy and pleasure and abundancy. Um, and I think there's also some really shared approaches that 
I only really saw when we were putting them all together around multiplicity, liminality, the substance in between, the messy toxicity, configurations and constellations, the refusal to work in straight lines, which I think is really interesting. Um, and also thinking about rave time and what that might mean. Um, and refusing to work historically in straight lines as well. So I think Ben's mind map of those hanging beads, I thought was really use, useful for that as a, as a real reminder that one of the things that maybe Wave can toxically bring into the university, particularly in this particular moment of arts and humanities, is recognizing that how we work matters. Um, how we work as an embodied way matters, how we work collectively matters, and that we should remember all of the different systems that we should be telling to fuck off. And I think that's really important as well. Okay, so I thought um, what I'd ask you to do a little bit is to think about, um, if anyone wants to chip in, to think about what does it mean to be doing this in a university? I was struck by how thoughtful the use of the art gallery space is as a place to dance. You know, there's a, this isn't about hanging up an exhibition in a club. It is about using dancing within a gallery space. And that did make me think about what are we doing talking about rave in a university and what might the implications of that be? So I thought one of the things I thought is that I'd, I'd ask one of our, I'd ask our postgraduates or our students to say something first. And then I thought I'd ask to, ch to chip in after that. So is there anyone who wants to just talk through what happens when you tell someone that you work on club cultures or you work on rave as a student? Does anyone want to respond? Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, so what does it mean to be doing it in, you know, in this incredibly commercialized, marketized university education where you know, your degree is talked about in terms of the cost of your fees? What does it mean to be doing rave within a university setting? I think it's interesting because I think that, again, it feels really separated from the space of the subject. So it feels like it, it almost feels like the antithesis of what you're studying. But I think there's a really nice kind of like two way to that, whereas then you're actually it, it kind of almost pushing back against that itself by, by being able to study that in that environment. Um, but then also, I think there's, there's the other side which says, well, actually, then you should take the method from the rave a bit more and maybe take stuff outside of the outside of the classroom but just on what you're saying now i think telling people that you studied that as a subject even now it's like a lot of it receives that kind of like oh well that's not history is it or that's not that's not proper history um so i think again like challenging that is really really important and actually being able to produce things as well like we i guess we did with the um digital thing and all these projects that are going on like actually being able, being able to produce things and go this is a result of method and subject and it is just a great way of like showing how that is proper history and how that does have and and kind of like Ben was well everyone's saying really like all these things relate back to politics and political climate and kind of like class and culture and race and all these things that we talk about all the time as, as historians anyway so seeing that that constellation again just applies to all these things that is proper history. Um, yeah, that's just kind of my thoughts. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Daniel. Does anyone else want to want to chip in on what I kind of what responses they get or what it means to be to be doing rave in a university? John. John. If, if you're sure, I, 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 this is more sort of just picking up on something that Daniel said in a way, if that's all right. But. Um, uh, I thought it was it was well worth pointing out that when we actually took um, the results of the DIT digital project out into the public with, with the the festival event, which while while it might not be in person, I was doing these Zoom calls with um, groups of um, families with their kids and um, heritage professionals and um, local residents, grown up residents who were just curious about local history and what we were going to do with it, then it, I think it really underlined the, the value of, um, uh, of, of projects like this for um, showing that the arts and humanities um, are um, really a vital part of, of, of people's lives, really. And, and, and that the, these people who wouldn't necessarily have thought about um, studying this stuff in a very academic way got so much out of um, not just hearing what the history was of the landscapes that they would take for granted, um, but also because of the way we structured it, then we were actually inviting them to think about, well, this is what the history was, but should it have been like that? If you had the choice, could you have made it something else? Um, and so that's, that's you know, 
giving a sense of empowerment and 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 permission to to own them the the history of where they are and 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 the identity of where they are um uh, not that you know we necessarily are the the arbiters of, of who gets that permission they live there but i think it, it, you could tell that it did um it, it did spur people to, to to look at things in a way that they necessarily hadn't and they were excited about doing that as well i think i mean one of the things that we really focused on and actually has come out of all of the discussion is let's write the history that we wished we'd had and and I, I think actually I'd, I'd like to I'd like to bring in Alyssa partly because um, of the things that Alyssa said about how we write and I think that's really important. Um, uh, you know, there's there's a tendency in subcultural history, subcultural studies, to be incredibly theoretical or to be very much kind of participant observation. And we can problem. And actually, one of the things that rave history might let us do is problematize those kind of insight, the division between an insider account and. A theoretical scholarly work. But Alyssa, I'm going to invite you in to talk through some of your responses in terms of writing grave history or, or just reflecting on its status in a university. Um, well, I, I think if you talk to different people, if I talk to people my age doing, I don't know, zoology or geography in my house, that me talking about doing my dissertation on rape had a very different response to when I told my parents that's what I was doing. Um, but what was really nice, actually, they were my editors in chief, my whole dissertation. Um, and sorry about the doorbell. Um, they, we went to the pop up museum in Carnaby Street of Museum of Youth Culture, and it was really nice. It was my my two parents and my older sister, and then it started a really nice conversation about how my dad was a bit of a metalhead, my sister loved the Spice Girls, and it was kind of a history that. One second, let me close my door. <laughs> <laughs> um, it started up a really nice conversation. All the things that they didn't think was history which was and I think even for them they didn't understand that until they kind of went to this museum and read my dissertation um so I think it's, it's nice broadening like you said what history is not just the cold war and all that kind of stuff um and then in terms of writing rave history I don't necessarily know what the question was um what did you want me to talk about just in terms I wrote? Of, it was really interesting what you're saying about actually uh, about how rave history can have a different form and a different voice in some ways, I just wondered if there was anything else that you wanted to say about that, or and indeed that other people might want to say about you know what voices are you? Do you work on a different with a different voice when you work with Rave? I suppose it's one of the questions I'm thinking about. I think so. And what was quite nice that I feel like I could, I could bring it into other sections of my work. I did a fashion module, and I spoke about how liberating the corset was, and I spoke a lot of that about punk corsets and Vivian Westwood. And I, there was a different tone when you started talking about Vivian Westwood and a very punk type of subcultural fashion. The tone of that paragraph was very different to me talking about 18th century corsets. And I think that's quite nice. Is that I think it's now naturally you end up talking a bit subculturally and you add in a bit too many like italics and stuff like that because you feel like you can experiment a little bit more. Um, and in my dissertation, I was very open. I said about how exhausted I was and how I was bored of writing about how women are always forgotten. I'm, just sick of it really which I never would have put in an essay when I did in second year and that was just two years difference because I think you do embrace that kind of subculture way of writing because you feel like you've got more creative license too so it doesn't it doesn't seem right using that kind of history and then not kind of deviating from the norm it feels like you're contradicting yourself I think that's really interesting and also I think that's about the emotional labor right when we're writing in when we're writing in marginalised or um, victimised experiences into a, an, an emerging canon, that's a huge amount of emotional work, I think, isn't it? Has anyone else got anything that they want to add in in terms of about writing? If not, the other question that I thought I'd ask is why rave? Right. So what does rave do that thinking about Northern Soul or thinking about punk doesn't do? You know, I kind of think, is, there, is, is rave letting us do something different? Malcolm, I'm going to bring you in. Are you going to talk about writing? Yeah, yeah, I was. Um, I was interested in what um, Alyssa was saying as well about the, the writing thing. When when I was writing, I try I listened to the music that I was writing about. So when I was, that means that the book book gets kind of really fast when I'm writing about jungle and uh, slows down a tiny bit on grind, but it becomes quite fast paced. But I was trying to get the feeling. I was kind of trying to have an intimate relationship with the sound and the sound culture, not being in those spaces as I was writing them. So that was my kind of technique for trying to bring the rhythms and intimacies of the music into the into the book. But yeah, I was really interested in those reflections. Thanks, Lucy. 
Thanks, Malcolm. That's, I think that's, I think thinking about how we take the, the lessons of the sonic and the embodied and the technological into our writing, I think is a really nice place to finish. I'd also really like to thank Alyssa for mentioning the Museum of Youth Culture. So it, the Museum of Youth Culture are doing a talk tomorrow uh, as part of the same sort of strand as this is at 11. And we're also going to invite you to put your own photos of your own youth into the Museum of Youth Culture archive. So that might be something interesting to come up against. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much, everyone. We're going to call it a day and we've hit time perfectly. So thank you very much. See you in the next one.